it was no thought that it was a dream? No. So even when I was looking at my dog, I was like, am I dreaming? What is this? What's going on? I was like, woof. No. I'm like, nothing. I don't actually have any clue what really happens when you die or when you're alive or what's going on with your spirit. And I think what about him meant, what if this guy finds me dead next to him? Yasmin. Yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Of course, the true pleasure. I feel like we made this uh, happen pretty quickly, so yeah. I do I do appreciate that. Yeah. And um, grateful to have you here. I think uh, we're about to tap into a very interesting story that's going to cover a, a few different avenues and all that's in between. You mentioned that you had a near death experience. I did. Yeah. And you also lost your father. And there's a lot of other ins and outs that kind of come with, I guess, both of them. You mentioned something in regards to your beliefs have changed or fluctuated. Yeah. So where does it all start and how does it all tie in to death in this conversation? Yeah. Well, right around the age of maybe nine, ten, I started doing this thing when I was really little where you would like make yourself pass out. Oh, yeah, I've Remember done that. Remember that? Yeah. I would do that a lot. Not proud of that, but I've definitely yeah. done that. Yeah, I don't know what that was about. As a kid, I think I was trying to escape. I think I was, like, traumatized. I don't know if you... Oh, wait, so you were doing it in a sense of escapism as opposed to, like, recreation? Oh, I think when a child is doing that form of recreation, it's like when an adult is doing drugs. You're escaping. Oh, something guess, yeah. something with what you are, how you're feeling in your own body or your circumstance requires for you to... <clears throat> um, Leave. Oh shit! That's what, that's what I was doing. I guess. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyone doesn't know. You literally put your hands like I had someone else put yeah. your hands to oh, your yeah. neck and, and just pass against the what wall. What a terrible thing to do. Honestly, yeah. You really. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I for, you just bringing back memories of me and my stupid friends doing this. To be honest, but anyway, sorry. No. Carry on. So I would do this as a as a kid, and then at around age eleven, it progressed into it accidentally happening without me doing it, where I would pass out. I would pass out. And I would recall passing out, like I would stop breathing. This is a bizarre story. I don't even... When I was 11, that's like the first time I ever tried smoking weed. And it's because older kids that were um, like 15, 16, (laughs) got me high because they thought it would be funny. So I wasn't with like same age friends doing something because I thought it would be fun. Mm -hmm. It was like a bunch of older kids playing a prank on me. And I guess it was such an intense experience that it happened to me while awake and while not doing it myself where I was there and I just like stopped breathing, passed out. And when I would come to is when I would breathe, I would feel like an electric, like, um, kind of like electricity, like, you know, when your legs fall asleep Mm -hmm. and you smack them awake, felt like that, but like whole body. And I would like take a breath and I would come to. So this continued happening throughout my life. That's like when it started. And then it kind of turned into this weird sleep apnea where I would sometimes stop breathing while I'm sleeping and I would pass out in my sleep. And I would have to take a massive gasping breath of air while I was passed out in my sleep so that I could wake up and take a breath and like that electric feeling would ha- happen and I would wake. And I was, how old was I? I was in my 20s and I think it was like uh, 2010, like 2010, 2000, maybe 11. I think it was 2010. I was sleeping in my bed, in my apartment, and I was next to my then boyfriend and fell asleep like any other day. And somewhere along the lines of being asleep and not being asleep, I was awake. And I realized that, oh, I'm awake, I'm not asleep, I'm in my room, I looked at my dogs. I used to have three little dogs. I looked at my pet dog. At that time, I only had one, actually, Bianca. I looked over at her, and she was, like, perked up just watching me. Didn't come towards me, but just was watching me. And I didn't think anything of it. I looked up at the ceiling, and I saw that there was, like, 
a light on the ceiling, but it was like the size of the, a grain of sand. It was like the tiniest light mm. that you could ever see, but it was like brighter than the sun. It was bright. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, I'm not on drugs. I'm not drunk. I'm literally just, I don't know why in my mind I was like, this is normal. Mm. Like, and I'm just curiously looking at the light. And the more I would look at the light, the closer I would get to the light and the light got really huge and it basically swallowed me whole. And at this point, I didn't have any stream of consciousness. I didn't have a thought. I wasn't having any words or like, you know, how you think in words. I wasn't really thinking anything. I was just feeling great. It felt like, you know, when you're like on a swing set and someone's pushing you when you're a kid and you're like, yeah. <laughs> That's the feeling. It was just like, ah, <laughs> like you're on MDMA. You're like you're surrounded by love. So every time I was on a swing, it was MDMA. It wasn't just pure happiness. Got it. <laughs> you know, yeah. all the feel good chemicals, whether you're on a swing or you're doing MDMA, it's the same stuff's happening in your brain. Mm-hmm. Lots of <laughs> serotonin. And that's what it felt like. I was just like, yeah, love, warmth, happiness, no thoughts. Zero thoughts. Nobody was there. I didn't have a body. I was not attached to my body. I didn't have like stream of consciousness, a sense of ego, a sense of like, oh, this is me and this is others. I was like experiencing the bright white light from the perspective of the great observer, I guess. I don't Mm. know. And just indifferent joy. That's the best way I can describe it. Like completely indifferent joy. And at the moment, you, it was no thought that it was a dream? No. I was having no... Even when I was looking at my dog, I was like, am I dreaming? What is this? What's going on? I was like, woof. No. I'm like, nothing. I was like, oh, like, no concept of time, mm-hmm. no thoughts. I wasn't having any thoughts about what I was experiencing. I was just on the fly experiencing And I don't know how long I was there. I don't know how, it was like, it felt like, it felt like years, but it also felt like an instant. And I remember the very, very, very first thought that I had, the very first sentence that came into my conscious awareness was, what about him? And I think what about him meant What if this guy finds me dead next to him? Do I leave this person behind, the boyfriend? And as soon as I said, what about him? The white light completely dissipated, like like a cloud, like mist dissipated. And I realized I'm not in my body. I'm floating above my body. I'm no longer in the white light. And I'm just like slowly descending back into my body. The minute I touched down fully into my body, I sat up straight, took a huge gasp of breath, the electricity feeling, like as if I hadn't been breathing for a while, just started like panting and just gasping for air. The boyfriend at the time woke up and I told him what had happened. And in my mind, I was like, uh, my whole concept of spirituality, my whole concept of heaven, hell, what happens after death, all of that became very muddied. I was very confused. But then in my mind, I thought, hey, I was brought back from the, like the dead to be with this man. I married him. I ended up married. That's all it took. <laughs> when, I you, married when you know, him. you know. Uh, well, I ended up divorcing him. Okay, well, never mind. <laughs> there goes that. Um. But you know, you make, you make inferences as to like what the meaning of certain things are. And for me, I was like, that's the meaning of this experience is you're meant to be with this person. I still believe that karmically I was meant to marry him, actually. I think that there was a lot of unpacking and learning and healing that had to happen specifically with him. But that was a, a really bizarre experience. So what, ha- so what happened? Like, what, like is there a, something medically happened? Or like what, how, do you, how, how do you feel like you feel like you like, – that was a clearly an experience. Yeah. But what, what makes you define it as like you died? You know – I never thought that I did. So when it initially happened, I was more confused than anything. Like I never had any definitive opinions about it. I never was like, oh, I died. 
right. and then I came back from the dead. It was more like something's wrong with my brain. It stops breathing. And when it does, bad things can happen. I pass out. And this particular time, I happened to pass out long enough where my, this is, at that time I was very science oriented and I, my conclusion was, I had two conclusions. My conclusion was my brain must have ran out of enough oxygen where that's what that experience feels like. Mm -hmm. And my second conclusion was, well, hey, if there is an afterlife, my understanding of it and the understanding that had been taught to me in religious classes may not be correct. And it feels more like I'm an electron going back into the, the immense light. Like you are singular electron joining the field of electrons and you go from being a particle, which is you're alive, to wave, which is now you are in, you can't be discriminated. You can't be like picked apart from all the other waves. Sheesh. And that's the thought that I had. And I just thought, well, how beautiful that I, whatever it was, that I was brought back and my hand was placed back in my body right next to this particular person that I'm with. This is the person I must be, must need to journey with. And I married that man within like three months of that, that no way. experience. Yeah. So did it feel, that feeling that you had, that experience that you had, it, it was just like a knowingness feeling that like that was whatever happens after, or maybe it's before or it's a place we've always been. I don't know. Just, it was a knowingness that this is maybe what it's like after we pass. There was never a knowingness. It was almost like, <clears throat> it felt like, Hey, what about this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this giant fucking light. And yeah. I was like, have to marry I was like, this man. Hey, what about this? And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. And then that's when my father passed People would be like, he's up in heaven watching you. And I'd be like, I don't, I don't know if, if he's him. I don't mm. know if he's him. It's an electron, I think, I think he's just back with the ocean of light. Like, I think he's just back with the singularity. I don't know how to make sense of any of this. And so when my father passed away, I thought I was losing my damn mind because... Whatever that experience was, my father's death was even more bizarre because here I am. I don't actually have any clue what really happens when you die or when you're alive or what's going on with your spirit. I'm very science oriented, but I try to like make some spiritual, you know, inferences. And then my dad dies and immediately he starts showing up. In almost all of my dreams, he's constantly visiting me in my sleep. And then he started visiting me while I was awake, physically. And that was making me think that I was maybe going schizophrenic at that time. I was like, oh, shit. So you, you uh, really thought something yeah, was happening. I was like, oh, shit. Like, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> You've lost, you're losing your marbles. <laughs> I guess it's funny now, but at that time, it was some fight club shit. <laughs> no, I was like... I was confiding in friends and telling them, and people thought it was so beautiful. They were like, oh, he's here with you. And I'm like, what? I don't know, man. Yeah, none of my <laughs> this, friends would say that. This like, feels like, a- yeah, like I had a lot of friends who were just like, this is beautiful. Like I have a lot of, some of my closest friends are very like into astrology, into the spiritual world. And it was such a funny dichotomy because I was so science oriented. We're definitely in LA. I was losing my mind. That. <laughs> We're in the heart of LA right now. No, I'm just teasing. Yeah. I'm just teasing. Go on. No, it's true. I mean, we're in LA. <laughs> this is where it is. This is where you're going to have a shamanic crystal gathering. Um, <laughs> if if yeah. there's ever going to be one, it's going to be here. This is, a, this is interesting. So, the, the part, the, explain the physical part where you're getting yeah. confused. Yeah. So, on. I would have, I would, like, let's say I would go to, have you ever been to the uh, self actualization temple? No. It's this place in Malibu. They have Gandhi's ashes there. It's beautiful. Is it worth a visit? Yeah, I think it's beautiful. That's, it was my dad's favorite place when he would visit L.A. Oh, no way. Okay. And I remember when he died, I was like, oh, I, I want to go back there. And I went back there. And then as I was, like, walking, he was standing in his spot with his hands behind his back. And I'm like, oh, God damn it. I'm losing my mind. Like, this is fucked up. 
<laughs> when you say you saw him, it literally as if I'm looking at you yeah. like that. Yeah. What? Yeah. Just standing. And I told my friend and my friend's like, what? I'm like, right over here. I don't know what to say. You feel calm about it? I think every time I did feel very calm about it. I was never like scared. Mm. And then another time I was walking home, crossing the street. And as I was crossing the street, he was crossing, he crossed path me, past me. And it was in North Hollywood. And then he had his hands again behind. He always used to walk with his hands behind his back like that. And I just felt like he was just like following me around. And I just thought, this does not go because my near-death experience, I didn't even have a body. Like whatever that experience was, I wasn't even part of my physical body. How is it that I am imagining, and I really thought I was imagining, his physical body in this like weird intermediate state, like ghost, which I don't believe in. I don't believe in ghosts. Mm -hmm. Even to date? <laughs> I still don't. So what the hell happened? Where are we going with this? No, man. <laughs> I'm open. That's, that's the best way is like I'm open to anything being true, and, but I'm not like this is this is firmly the truth, but I'm open to it. So you're like the school of skeptics. I'm like, yeah, I'm part of the school of skeptics and positive nihilists. Right. <laughs> We're we'll going to tap into that one at some point, if not now. But <laughs> And so he would just kind of exist in weird spaces and I would speak to him and he would speak to me. Did you get checked out at any point? You clearly yes, he, he, I spoke to a psychiatrist. And what did they say? They were like, no, you're just grieving. This is like a normal part of grieving sometimes. And I was like, okay. And like, but my dad would give me like solid advice. <laughs> like what? what you... <laughs> like he'd be like, oh, I'm thinking about like, I'm wondering about this thing. Like I really want this particular thing. And he'd be like, how could you possibly want this particular thing when you're doing X, Y, and Z? If you're going to be doing X, Y, and Z, you're never going to have that one thing. So you need to stop. Mm. So in my mind, I thought, this is interesting. Maybe this is my higher self coming down as my dad, being like, you don't listen to yourself. I'm your dad. <laughs> what do you think now? <laughs> yeah, jokes on you. Yeah. But then it went away. Like, it didn't continue. Ever again? No. How long did this period happen? This period lasted for about a year after his passing. So right after he passed. Right after he passed. next year. He Yeah, he existed very intensely in my life, gave a bunch of advice. Um, Accurate advice that you felt helped? Yeah. Yeah. Bizarre. Uh, well, Mick, okay, so Mick, okay, so your dad passes. Yeah. Your dad dies. You have this experience for a year. How did you, and your therapist, psychiatrist said that this, oh, you're just grieving, just shocked at yeah. the grieving. I've never heard that. My grief does some wild shit, so who knows. Where were you in the grief process? Was there any, were you in a state of... Like, what was your state that would kind of maybe lead to this, if that's even a correlation? Yeah. Like, what I, was your grief? Yeah. I feel like right as he passed, I was, I didn't cry at his funeral. I felt like I had to be really strong for my mom. And the day I found out he passed, I had really important meetings with this um, like television network and a manager. And I remember like, I just continued. I just pretended like, oh, I didn't hear that. I will deal with his death um, when, when I'm ready. But right now I'm just going to carry on as if like, so I, I very deeply was like disassociated and denial right away. That's the first thing that happened in my grief process. We went to go to the funeral. I remember I wrote the eulogy and like organized a bunch of stuff with my siblings. And I just like remained very lucid, very organized, very like, this is what's happening next. Here's what's happening. Do you need help? Someone's crying. This is funny. That's not funny. I was cracking jokes because he was a very funny guy and he did funny things. And when I'd notice funny things, like that's hilarious. Um, and, <laughs> and the guy that I had been dating who became my husband was experiencing this with me and we're in the Middle East where they don't even wash the body of the dead for you. When someone dies, they hand it over to the family to wash themselves. That's a bizarre experience. So like my ex-husband had to like see my dead father naked, 
bathe him with my brothers and uncles, sing prayers over him. We wrapped him with like white cloth and then we just all got to hang out with my dead dad without any embalming or anything. Ooh. It was like really it was it was just like very connected. Right, I mean, to him. there has to be a reason why that is a yeah. tradition. So is that healing to you? I thought so. I mean, when Maybe I thought everyone thought it was weird, but I was standing there, like, holding his face. Oh. <laughs> and my mom's like, stop touching him. I'm like, this isn't him. <laughs> They're like, you need to stop touching him. I'm like, guys, this is not him. Like, Very calm. Very calm. Did that concern anyone? N- no, not I guess. you or anyone? I, like- yeah, but I was like, this is not him. This is like just his body shell, and it doesn't even look like him. Because I, I have you ever seen dead people after they die? Yeah, it's not, it's, it's not the same. They don't look the same. No, something something's different. It's like every muscle in their body that was keeping their, I don't know, gesture, their permanent. You know, like there's a faces that we make. It just goes like, and but everything kind of collapses back, and like you don't look like you. Yes. Your face doesn't look like you, and I just was like, this isn't him. All right. Now we're doing the the funeral. Let me hold my mom. And I was just like, oh, we're pouring rose water into the grave. Didn't know that. Oh, so this is like, I was just like going through like <laughs> these motions. <laughs> completely it's like you've done detached. this before. Yeah. yeah. It's like, oh, well, it's time for me to sing. I will sing a song. <laughs> uh, so bizarre. So, how, I mean, what, so what was your calculation with all this? I, I know you mentioned that you... You just felt like you had to just, you'll get there when you're ready. Yeah. And you had this year of yeah. seeing your father. Yeah. Was that like, did the psychiatrist mention anything about that? Is your, the grieving process yeah. forcing you to grieve? Yeah. It was, it was almost like coming to terms with his death and having all the conversations with him that I didn't have, didn't have the opportunity to have. I felt very alienated by my father throughout my life. And like I had deepest closeness that anyone could ever have with a parent in that year, in that after. year. Yeah. After his passing. So you got closer with your father after he died. Yeah. Yeah. Very much. I felt like I had all of the closure conversations I needed to have. I really, like, we really, really bonded. And I don't know who's we. I don't know if it was me bonding with that part of my brain that keeps him alive in there. And then, you know, I just assumed he's with me. He's with me. And after that year, I just felt like he was with me, but that he wasn't going to like physically be visiting and like auditorially speaking to me. And that feeling of like, I'm losing my mind went away where I was like, oh, my mind is back. That was weird. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you just carry on? Like you didn't look yeah. at, did you look into anything, research anything, or try to figure out what the heck that was? I spoke to a friend of mine who's a psychiatrist, and, like, we really dug into it. And he was like, you know, the mind is a very, like, bizarre thing, and it's a very powerful thing. And sometimes people can literally, like, have car accidents and visualize a whole host of people coming to visit them that never came. Or these things happen that never happened. And, like, the mind finds ways to protect. and Like, you know, when children experience, like, extreme trauma and they, like, create other little imaginary friends that help them through things. I guess that, to me, the science part of my brain was like, this tracks, feels right. Feels like I made an imaginary dad to walk around. <laughs> that looked exactly like him, yeah. And just giving me really good advice. Good advice. Yeah. And, um, but then I would meet people. Like, I have, we're in L.A. We have... Psych- I'm sure you have some psychic friends. Do you have yeah, psychic- a few on here? Yeah. Yeah. And I remember my psychic friends would be like, he's here. And I'm like, what's happening? And they're like, your dad is here. And I'd always be like, I accept. Like, if people think that this is what's happening, I'm going to be open to it. And I remember one time a friend of a friend of mine called me out of a, the blue. And she was like, your father has been having a really hard time because he's been stuck to you for years now since his passing. And he's never made it through to the other side. That white light that you went to or like you, he never, he's not gone. He's not there. I was like, what? She's like, yeah, I want to do like a ceremony and, and help him pass through. And I'm literally receiving a call out of the blue from a person who really wants to help my father pass through because apparently she, I don't know, 
She called you. She called me. And I was like, okay. How long after was this? Of your this day? was um, 2021. Okay. So he passed in 2016. Right. Okay, years later. Yeah. That's even more bizarre. Because bizarre. people had always been telling me, he's with you. Oh, by the way, he's with you. My publicist was the last person to say, he's with you. Does she have a history of... She is also like... Um, uh, Claire, what do you say? Clairvoyant, clairvoyant, gifted. Like she has, you know, and she's like, oh, there, he's with you. So people will come to me and be like, mm, he's like your person. He's like with you. And I'm like, I, this is what? so bizarre to me. That yeah. Where's my dad? <laughs> <It's with you. laughs> like, I'm like, but also like, is he not with my other siblings? I have other siblings. Wait, what do you believe? Man, I'm open. I don't know. Just okay. see what happens? Kind yeah, of yeah, yeah. I'm open. Has, it, have all these experiences been positive for you? That's yeah. Question, but, all of it has <laughs> been. I feel like before my father passed away, I had a lot of like financial troubles all the time. And my dad was, you know, like many fathers are, the bank of the family, like the, the financial stability of a family. And I remember growing up as a teenager and in my 20s, I would refuse his help. I'd be like, I don't want to do things myself. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And I was on a struggle bus. And I remember after his passing, things got real smooth financially. And a friend of mine came and she was like, don't you think that that's your dad? He kind of just like opens doors for you financially and like you've never had any financial troubles since his passing. And I've always been like, that's a really... Huh. Astute observation, and it's true. Things get put in my path. The person I'm with right now, my life partner, I feel like my father selected him. Genuinely, I feel like he selected him. Our first date was on his. Um, no, our first date wasn't on his day of passing. Our first date that we like decided, like, oh, we are a couple, and like we're gonna was incidentally on the the date of my father's passing, but I didn't want to say anything because it's like weird. I just met this guy. Yeah. Like, I don't want to be like, by the way, my the way, dad died today. You asked me out um, tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so I went on this date and I just felt like, it just felt really bizarrely like chosen for me. And I've always felt like, oh, the person I'm with, my father chose. And the things that happen and, and get put in my path, in a weird way, it always feels like, oh, that's your dad. Interesting. That's your dad helping me. And, and, and some people don't have their parents who have passed helping them. And of course, like I have siblings, like what's he doing? Or is he talking to them? I don't know. But I spoke to them and he wasn't speaking to them. That's why I thought I was going crazy. <laughs> so you, you, you feel like you're not going crazy. That's good. No. Right? Yeah. I think it's been long enough. It's been long standing enough where like that was just one year after his passing. And then after that, it's just like this warm feeling that I have where I feel like, oh, I feel protected. I feel guided. I feel like he's got my back. So but by, with those feelings intact, do you feel like you, is that all part of your grief process? Like it was ever a, a, part, a moment of, not collapse, but where you felt more emotion? Or yeah. You, or no? Oh, yeah. I mean, three months after his passing, that's when all my emotions came. Oh, that's okay. where so I started bawling my eyes out and really grieving and really like going through like the sadness. Okay. The first three months, there was no sadness. It was just shock and like, hmm. Huh. So what got hmm. it out? Like, was there, was there if, it, if there even was a moment that you remember, like, was it, does anything specific happen where, okay, after that three months, you, something, a trigger or was there just a night? Hmm. I'm thinking. Whatever I it was, it just no. came out. Yeah. I think it's just sometimes people go into shock when they hear news that they can't handle. Sure. 100%. And then slowly they start to process what's happened in their body. I think maybe it makes more sense if so. Recently, I was diagnosed with the um, autism spectrum. And I think looking at it from that perspective, it tracks mm -hmm. because when autistic people experience certain um, events or emotions that are too intense or too uh, difficult to process, they will have what's called like delayed emotional reaction. Whereas like, oh my God, it's a pandemic and everyone's grieving and the autistic experience is like, this is interesting. <laughs> and, like, and then it takes some time for them and then they're like, I am sad. 
how, does that, how does that work? Like, how does that work in the brain? What, what is that about? The autism? mechanism of why it slows, I don't know. Because also autistic people might have very large reactions to very small things right. that a person who doesn't have autism, they'll be like, oh, that's nothing. And then the person who's like, there's too many, there's so many like sounds and then they'll start crying or Got like it. there's too many feelings on my skin and they'll start I've seen crying. that, yeah, for sure, I've seen that. And then there's times where like a really drastic, terrible thing has happened, like rape, death, illness, and they will have a completely delayed, like no emotion, until and everyone might think that that's weird. And I'm like, why is this person have no emotion? But like the emotion comes, it just like it takes some time for it to like process. And I don't know. And during that time where it takes time to process, is there any subconscious processing, or is it literally just stopped in its tracks and you're just going to deal with it later? Yeah, I don't think it's a conscious decision. No, no, definitely it doesn't seem yeah. conscious. But like, you think it's just when it hits you, it, that's it's almost like hitting you for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. Well, at least you get shit down in those first three months. Yeah, yeah. No, I was like very, very productive and this, <laughs> initially. This, this was what, eight, nine years? How long has it been? 2016? Yeah, t- yeah, 2016. 2016. So, how, how do you feel today? I feel like there's times when I will watch videos of my father and I just like feel sad. I just so, yeah. feel this deep sense of like, oh man, like, he won't be able to laugh at this one thing or he would have found this thing funny Mm -hmm. or like he won't be able to experience good memories with us. But then I also have, I have a lot of cognitive dissonance about all of this stuff, death, afterlife, science and spirituality, because I feel like I'm open. I'm very open. And yet not all of it fits with each other if he exists and I feel these warm feelings, how do I make sense of my near-death experience and not being attached to my body? How do I make sense of any of this? If I really don't know what happens next, how can I make any assumptions or conclusions out of this? I can't. So I just have to choose to be okay in this realm of gray zone and be like, I don't really know what's the truth, but it feels right and it feels it feels healthy. So I will just sit with it until I die and find out for real because I won't know. So, I, I mean, the key word you said there that stuck out is you said choice. Mm-hmm. So do you find it easy to make a choice to feel a certain way and feel that way? Yeah, I feel like we all have to choose. Like, you can choose to believe in God. You can choose to believe in life after t- death. You can choose to not believe in God. You could choose not to believe in life after death. You can choose to believe in this religion versus that religion or no religion. Um, I think that we don't choose to feel emotions because emotions are um, like sen- sensory, like we feel them in our body. Mm-hmm. So you can, for example, you can block an emotion, like let's say sadness. You can block sadness. But your body is still experiencing that sadness. Either you're consciously not processing it or you are denying or avoiding it. But it still is existing and moving through your body however that it needs to. Like People can say, I'm not angry. But you can see that they're turning red and like (laughs) they're clammy and like their heart rate is up. And you're like... Your body is. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what about in the opposite direction? You, cho- you have the choice to be happy or you have the choice to choose joy through grief. Oh, I see what you're saying. You're saying choose joy through grief. So like the conscious choice, like, like yeah. you, you accepted the situation with your father, it seems like. I don't know if, yeah. if I'm wrong. That was a choice to accept that. So I, I understand what you're yeah. saying. Like emotions are often a response, but... I think that response is dictated by the way we perceive certain things. So by choosing to perceive a certain way, you can kind of choose to be happy or X, Y, Z. I don't know if any of that's right. That's just my thought. You know, I love that thought. And I think that we can choose to surrender, like choose to accept. Like one of the things that... um, 
I came to the conclusion of at one point was that there's no like, I want to be happy rather than sad. Like some people are like, choose to be happy, man. You can just be happy. Why not be happy? Why be sad if you can be happy? It's like, why have this, you know, meal at this place when you can have this grand uh, five-star Michelin star meal over here? It's like, why not shut the fuck up? <laughs> but, I, but at the same time, it's like, that's putting a value on the emotion. That's saying happy better than sad. Sad worse than happy. But I actually think they're neutral. They're the same. They're the same? Yeah. How? I think that they're just sensory experiences. So it's like, is that good or bad? Well, there's a specific chart or theory. I forget what it's called. Is it yeah, the feeling wheel. Is that what it is? Yeah, it has the opposite. So like... What is across from anger? What is across from joy? Like I don't know if that's the same thing I was thinking. Because there's one that I think each one is literally a different vibration. So therefore, they're not equal because there's a there's a higher. Oh, because there's like high like vibration, love is lower like the vibration. One. Yeah. So it's like I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Just, I don't believe in that. <laughs> what do you believe in? I think they're neutral. Okay. I think they're. I think that like. I think they're transition. They're transitionary experiences that can be experienced in your mind and your body that are meant to help you navigate through experiences that you're having a difficult time processing. Like, you know how cows, they ruminate on grass mm -hmm. and they eat grass and it takes a really long time for them to digest it. We ruminate through our emotions and we chew on them and chew on them and chew on them until we get all the nutrients out. And then we're like, okay, I worked that one through. I worked it out. And you don't want to get stuck like, I'm, I'm a Zen Buddhist, so in Buddhism, they will teach you never to cling onto the light. Don't cling. You know, a lot of our positive psychology is very much about clinging to the light and banishing the dark. Mm -hmm. And in Buddhism, at least, they will teach that yeah, it's neutral. Uh, don't cling. Uh, happiness comes and it goes. It's just as impermanent as sadness. It also comes and it goes. Let it move through you. It comes and it goes. It's just the human experience. So what state do you stay in? Is it like what state is, is the idea of Buddhism? Is it just uh, um, contentment? No, uh, um, acceptance of the reality of the truth of now. Which is? Whatever you're experiencing right then and there. Hey, if I hit your car, you're not going to be like, ah. <laughs> You're going to have some feelings about it. I would, if someone hit my car and did that, I'd be like, don't worry about it. I got this. I'm going to my insurance, but You're going to have some feelings about it. If someone betrays you, you're going to have some feelings about it. If someone gives you $3 billion tomorrow, you're going to have some feelings about it. And like, great. You are experiencing what it feels like to be a human person in your human body. Experience the feelings. Joy is happiness. Sadness is happiness. It's all, it's all, it's all good. All you know, of it is good. That approach is interesting because I feel like it will mitigate, like say, we're talking about grief, something you lose some of those feelings, which is probably e much easier said than done, but to pull back that pain and see it as this is an experience, this is life, this is what you got to go through. But what about like the happy stuff? Like I, I don't, like, I don't want to pull back the happy stuff if I feel happy, but then me, is it because that happiness, that happy moment is maybe just temporary? So if you get it too is. attached to it, that once you go back, it's like even worse? No, it's just temporary. Right, it's just stay in the middle. It's just temporary. It's just, <sighs> I, they call it like equanimity, a state of like, you're sitting in the middle and you see, you know, like in meditation, they will say, watch the thoughts pass by. Yeah. Well, in your body, you can also experience the emotions that pass by. Like, ooh. And they will pass by. Yeah, of course. They pass through you. That's then they will pass by. I think, I think sometimes. But they, we don't let them pass mm, by. Let them stay stagnant. Yeah. We hang on. <clears throat> we make it stuck. And how do you... I, I, I watched a video the other day about... Um, the video was talking about how to let go. Mm -hmm. And I may be butchering this, but the idea was uh, there was some teacher or something that was holding out a, gl a full glass of water. And the, the teacher, whoever it was, was like asking the students, how much do you think this water weighs? And people were like, uh, I don't know, a, a gram, a pound, whatever they were shouting. And they said the answer was more dictated on how long you hold the water. Because the longer you hold it, the heavier it's going to get. So it's going to progressively get 
heavier and heavier and harder to hold. And it kind of relates to like, if you hold something, so I actually didn't watch the end of the video. That's the only part I was found interesting when I had to turn it off because I was doing something. But it just made, I just related to that. And I was like, yeah, the longer you hold something, the heavier it's going to feel. Yeah. And how do you let, how do you just put down? Do you chug the water, drop the glass? Like what, how do you actually let go of something? Yeah, you have to build your relationship with yourself so much that you trust yourself so much so that you trust that you're going to hold on to it for as long as you need to. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes I ruminate on a person or a thought or a thing that happened to me and I just keep going round and round in my head. I'm like, oh, this happened like this. And then they said that. And then that's what happened here. And I go round and around. And I know it's a common human thing for people to like circle around the same event or a thing. Mm. And I used to guilt myself about that. I'd be like, let it go. I would gaslight myself. Like, let it go. Let it go. Like, Don't hang on to it. Just let it go. And I was like, well, hang on a second. I will trust that I'll let it go when I'm ready to let it go. Maybe I still need to ingest some nutrients out of this. Maybe there's something in here I haven't looked at yet. Maybe there's a lesson here I still haven't learned. Let me process. Let me have enough trust in myself to know I will process for as long as I need to on whatever I need to. As long as I'm, you know, here in the present moment and able to process the present experiences and feelings that are happening in my body and I have like some awareness of presence, I'm allowed to go to the past. I'm allowed to think of the future. I'm allowed to go anywhere that I want in my mind and experience all the things I need to experience in my body. And I trust I'll let it go when I let it go. And I always let it go. We always let it go. In the end, you let it go. Some there, people maybe they don't. Maybe some people do take things to their grave and don't let it go. That's what I'm saying. I think yeah. but I think I think a lot of people don't let go, and it comes to a point where I like the idea the idea of what you just said. If you're grieving, going through whatever the heck it is, or whatever you're holding on to, and not emotion, you're not letting go of. I like the idea of what I'm taking from what you said is being a little easier on yourself, yeah. saying there's no timeline per se, but at some point I think there is a a, a fine line between. You can't hold on to it too long. And I think there, there's a balance of kind of like figuring out. Yeah. It's like there's plenty of moments in my life where I'm holding on to something I know I should let go, but I can't because I'm attached to it. Yeah. Why is should? Should what? Why Why should? Why should you? I don't know. It's all neutral. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who the fuck cares anyway? <laughs> I, I mean, that's what I always say. I was like, where does the should come from? I think about like, <clears> where did the should come from? Sometimes the should is true. Sometimes it's, yeah, you should let go. And sometimes the should is this idea of a should. Mm, it's, not so, even our dear, I, it's not even our idea in the first place. Sometimes. No. And I think everything gets alleviated when you build a really trusting and compassionate relationship with yourself. If you have a super compassionate, trusting relationship with yourself, you don't let anybody throw you off kilter. Even you can't mm. throw you off kilter. Like, let's say someone's like, I'm telling you to do this. This is what you need to do in this situation. You can be like, I have enough discernment. I have enough wisdom. I, I actually trust my relationship with myself better than I trust my relationship with you or your relationship with yourself. Like, I accept and love your advice. And in my wisdom, because I have such a strong relationship with myself and because I have so much compassion for myself and there's clarity between me and me, I know when I'm ready. And then when you're ready, it just dissipates. What about people that don't have enough wisdom in, let's say, losing someone or yeah. whatever the hell you're going to that hasn't had the experience? Yeah. This is their first experience where they have to learn from yeah. to gain that wisdom. So someone that's in their grief right now and yeah. they lost someone, what do you say to them? Compassion. Hmm. Compassion. Just practice compassion. Literally. That's like the most Zen thing I can say. I really am a positive nihilist because like, I really don't know what's going to happen and I'm open to all of it. But compassion is like the, the very cornerstone of everything. Mm. Have compassion for yourself. Have compassion. For yourself is important. For yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. We're so hard on it. Yeah. I'm, I'm way too hard on my, I don't know, way too hard to should this, but like it's like I'm definitely need to. Well, you know, we are as hard on ourselves as wh- whoever raised us was on us right. when we were little they become our internal dialogue. If you had a parent or a caregiver or a teacher or a mentor who is really hard on you, they become the fabric of your inner dialogue with yourself. So really it's resolving that relationship with them the way I did in that one year with my dad. I had to resolve my relationship with my father 
so that he doesn't become part of my internal dialogue. Rather, he became part of my external dialogue. <laughs> so, yeah, that was, so that he could be like, peace out and peace, yeah, right? <laughs> I, just think, I, I mean, I feel like so much so much of the shit we go through we, uh, it stems from, you know, our, earlier in our life for sure. But I, mean, my, I, I wasn't even raised with parents that were like super, they, they I think they did it as a perfect balance. Yeah. Of, like, you know, like m- allow me to step up in certain times, but also gave me plenty of love. So I don't know what it is, but I, but I feel like I have a nice balance of, I think, of being aware when, when I am being too hard on myself. Yeah. So I do give my, I think I show myself some compassion, but I think I just have these I thoughts mean, and goals that I want to attain to, so I forcefully do it sometimes because I want to be better. Society does that to us. Like, we don't even need to have like a parent be that person who gives us these thoughts. Literally capitalism does it to us constantly from the day we're born. There are ideals that are baked into the fabric of our world. Yeah, and that's that's like it goes back to what you're saying have trust in yourself and yeah. and also being able to decipher what's your thought, what's someone else's, what have you been programmed and this or that. Yeah. And so I think what I'm taking, if, especially for if anyone out there that has lost someone or is grieving right now, I think that is a, a nice little lesson to pull from this is that trusting yourself, showing compassion yeah. to yourself and. Ah, I've said this a bunch of times too. We're just on a different timeline. There's no should either. No, everything happens Unless you're dying. when it Unless should. Like your body's deteriorating, and then you got a part. You probably should do something that's gonna. I think. I think you, like you said, yeah. it, we sh- would know when it's getting too bad. Yeah, but even then, you should have the wisdom to know. Like my father, but when you should have the wisdom. <laughs> well, yeah, should have the wisdom. But I mean, you you can have the wisdom to know. Like my father, when he was passing. So I would say the last three years of his life, he was passing mm. um, because three quarters of his heart was not pumping. His health was deteriorating. The medication that he was on was making him loopy. He was quite depressed. He had like really severe heart condition because he had already had four heart attacks up until that point. And I remember I was very hard on him. I moved back to uh, Dubai for like three months to like teach him yoga. Every day we did yoga. I put him on a vegan diet. There it is. (laughs) I prevented him from eating red meat. And I was like, we're not gonna eat fried things. We're gonna be healthy. We're gonna change our mindset. We're gonna get you healthy. And that is going to help you have longevity. And actually I learned a really, really important lesson. And it was in those last couple of years, where we could have been really just like experiencing joy together, we were experiencing a lot of tension because he really didn't want to. And like, I wasn't willing to accept he doesn't want to. Like, it's not up to me. He doesn't want to do this thing. I have to release my desire for him to want to be alive longer. That's such a lesson right there. I mean, outside of everything we're discussing in regards to the topic of this friggin' podcast, is that uh, you know, sometimes releasing expectation that's not ours to even yeah. expect. Yeah, we can't it's, control things. <laughs> that's the, I mean, that, that life is so much better when you start realizing that. I mean, there's certain things we can control, and I think that's just up here. Yeah. That's something different. Um, I don't know. It's just I'm getting too deep in my own shit right now, to be honest. It's just, oh, it's good. It's just even about get me. Get deep. Yeah, I know. Believe me, I, get I, deep. <laughs> I, I do often. And, uh, maybe I get too deep sometimes. But um, outside of that, how, to kind of like cap it off in many yeah. ways, how are, you, how are you today with, I guess, all your experiences? Yeah. But definitely the, 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 the grief of your experience with your father. How do yeah. you feel today? I feel that grief comes in waves. So some days I miss him more than others. Some days I remember him more than others. Some days I cry and some days, you know how it is. You don't feel anything. It's just like, yeah, he's dead. I can make jokes about it even. I can like joke around about things about it. Um, If there's any takeaway from any of this, it's for everyone out there, focus on building a really honest and compassionate relationship with yourself. Have compassion. And just let the grieving process happen however it needs to happen for you. Mm. And the less, you know, the less we feel safe, the more we want to control. So try to create safety in your body. Try to create safety in your network. If you find that you have a group of friends who don't feel safe, change them up. If you live somewhere that doesn't feel safe, change it up. If you can't change it up, 
Change how you're feeling in your body. Try to create some safety because we can only heal when we feel safe. Mm -hmm. If you feel safe and secure, you can start healing and grieving and thinking straight and working on like, oh, my discernment's getting better. Because sometimes our discernment is a little cloudy because we can't really see straight when everything's really foggy and like we're, you know, we're kind of in the weeds. Mm -hmm. But the... The more safe that you feel and the more honest that you're able to like put yourself at issue, make yourself the bad guy, make yourself the good guy, make yourself the crazy person losing her mind, make yourself not the crazy person losing her mind. Mm -hmm. Just kind of like work through it with honesty and then slowly like the river becomes clearer and you become a lot more um, like a lot more confident in your perspective mm. where you're like huh, that's how I feel and if someone tries to throw you off kilter you're like that's not how you should feel like I'm cool with it that's how I feel oh man that's it. <laughs> I like the river analogy so I, all I, as soon as you said that I don't know why I started taking myself to a place to, like swimming through the muck and you like you don't know when the hell you're gonna get out of there and then eventually you keep swimming long enough and a little bit of swimming and swimming and it starts clearing up in the yeah. but back there it didn't seem like I was ever gonna get out of it it always seems that way it always seems like that once you're in it it's always so much worse when you're in it and then um <laughs> And then like, when you're out, you're like, oh, that was easy. Yeah, yeah of course. That's literally <laughs> fucking, that's life in a nutshell. So uh, to anyone that's in the muck right now, just, uh, you know, keep paddling a little yeah, bit. Yeah, keep paddling. Keep paddling. Listen Don't to stop. Yourself. Yeah. But uh, listen, I appreciate um, you sharing all that and sharing some of your journey, your insights, your thoughts, and letting us into that mind of yours. Um, before, uh, again, before we officially stop, is there anything that you want to say in regards to like, uh, yourself I'll plug everything as usual uh, in, the, in the show notes to find you um, oh. but if there's any uh, last minute things you want to announce or just say peace out whatever you want yeah no I just want to say thank you so much for having me I'm very appreciative and grateful for the opportunity to have this conversation it's not frequent or often mm -hmm. or ever anyone has ever asked me to talk about these things these are just things that have happened and I don't really, you know, sit and, and speak about these things. So thank you for the opportunity to, to chat. And I, I really feel like, yeah, I just feel happy. Good. I love that. <laughs> Even though we should be neutral, we shouldn't be happy. No, uh, you, you I'm can playing, be. I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. No, I know, I'm just teasing. No, but I appreciate that too. That's, that's, the, that's the beauty, especially. I, I like even hearing that you haven't had these conversations because it's a, that's another voice. I'm, you already have a voice, but like you said, not maybe on this topic as often as perhaps. Yeah, I just it should don't be. talk. Yeah, I don't talk about this particular yeah, topic. It's, it's, I'm happy that you came on here. That's yeah. pretty perfect. Yeah. That's everything Thanks I wanted. Thanks for having me. Beautiful. Yeah. All right. Well, everyone, another episode of Dead Talks. Until next time, um, listen to the next episode too, the one before that, and this one again. So cheers. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. That'll give you updates as to when we post a new video, more episodes, and more content in general. We are streaming on all the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and all that. And also find us on Instagram at Dead Talks Podcast or www.deadtalks.net. Thank you so much.